Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Warbird Mistress. Uh, first things first, I want to give a special thank you to Andrei Tarasov for my new cover image. He's an amazing pinup artist, an absolute doll to work with, and I think he really captured me here. So check him out if you like, there's going to be a link in the comments. Speaking of comments, don't forget to leave yours and let me know what's on your mind so that way I could respond or have more ideas about future videos or anything else happens to be on your mind. So now boys, on to today's video. February 1927. Number 8 Squadron is sent to police the Aden Protectorate, part of the British Raj, and nearby Yemen, also known as the Memleka al Mutawakiliya al Yemeniya, or simply Mutawakalite Kingdom of Yemen. Now at this time, Aden is an alienated spot on the fringes of the empire, and it's under the Raj because of its importance with the Indian trade route. Local leaders have enjoyed British protection since the 1830s, and they're stuck in a part of the world where tribal conquests are within living memory, the economy is growing, and the Wahhabi Bayt al-Saud to the north is really starting to get a lot of oil wealth, and they've conquered most of the Arabian Peninsula. Meanwhile, they are also divided between the Shafi'i Sunni tribes of the coast and northeastern mountains, including Aden, and the Zaidiya Shia of the northwest and northern parts of the country, which remain the Kingdom of Yemen. The Zaidiya, or Fiber Shiites, have dominated Yemeni economic, political, and military affairs, and they feel challenged by the British taking on the role of peacemaker, bureaucrat, and trade broker. Their Imam Yahya of Sana'a, a member of the Hamidadin branch of the Al Qasimi dynasty, which has ruled Yemen for nearly a millennium, is a particular thorn in the British side and he is feared by his neighbors. Even the Bayt al-Saud is cautious with him. Ironically, he also courts Lieutenant Colonel Harold Fenton Jacob as he is desirous of British protection and the establishment of a nation-state to replace tribal rule, a nation-state under himself, of course. It is in the cultural, economic, and mercantile capital of Aden where tribalism ironically reigns supreme. Tribalism is yet another issue that the British have to deal with, and the Subaihi tribe in 1927 and 1928 is right at the top of their list. Their chiefs have refused to pay taxes to government authorities. They have confused government with a tree in an inconvenient place, yet with fruit ripe for the plucking, as much as they seem to have confused taxes with the tribute they once refused the Turks. In the midst of all of it lies the Royal Air Force. While Yemeni levies and His Majesty's troops are on the ground, the key to British strategy is in the air. In January of 1928, Number 8 Squadron is at RAF Hormaksar in today's Aden International Airport, and her mission is air policing. At the heart of this policy is Jan Smuts. This is well before the airport ever bore his name, and you know, we have to remember that he is a national hero to some people and a traitor to others. He had served under the immortal Kus de Rarai in the Vestransfall during the Second Freedom, or Boer War, and although tempted to be a bit reinder, he would support a surrender at the Vertrag van Vereniging. It is ironic that Smuts, called by many the father of the RAF, would look at the concentration camps established to eradicate his own people, and choose not only to collaborate with the British, but to help lead them in the Great War. It is rather disturbing that a man who had seen such horrors would invent air policing. His policies, while not as genocidally deviant as those he had seen in the final strike against the Afrikaners and their allies, would leave scars felt as much today as then. Air policing was first born on the backs of the RAF's Airco DH-9As over the mountains of Afghanistan and the northwest frontier. It would soon be a hallmark of Trenchard's leadership of the RAF. Smuts had devised a plan to use air power to destroy rebellion at its root. As he said, the day may not be far off when aerial operations with their devastation of enemy lands and destruction of industrial and populous centers on a vast scale may become the principal operations of war. Air power was just one more means of keeping control over remote areas of the empire, just as starvation had been used to control his brethren. While portrayed to the parliament and the public as a strategy of pacification and peacekeeping with the goal of making the prosecution of war undesirable, the reality is hidden by the RAF, the Colonial Office, and most of all the British press. Bombers are loaded with anti-personnel, incendiary, and chemical weapons, and sent against military and civilian targets. Marshal of the RAF Hugh I Viscount Trenchard pioneered the policy of strategic bombing in these small wars, straight out of the same mindset of Julio Douay. He declared that in the colonies one cannot separate combatants from civilians and that all affiliated with those in rebellion are a legitimate target. 
later the Air Marshal in command of Bomber Command, a young Rhodesian officer, Arthur Harris, used the blank check of law enforcement by air to develop his area bombing doctrines over the skies of Iraq in 1923. Bombing rebel villages out of RAF Habaniya, he would sow the seeds of the Anglo-Iraqi War of 1941 and of distaste for the West in general. Harris was quoted as prescribing one 250-pound or 500-pound bomb in each village that speaks out of turn when asked about the revolts in Palestine in 1936. The leopard never hid, let alone changed his spots. At a time when the majority of the world had never seen an airplane, and those in the most remote and backwards parts might never have even heard of one, the drone of a bomber overhead was as frightening as it could be. The RAF would destroy villages by air, using centuries on crops, and lay poison gas over Afghanistan, Iraq, the Gulf Protectorates, and East Africa. This allowed them to use native levies and the RAF armored car companies to keep order over rebellious tribes. In Afghanistan, a few raids could easily pacify a tribe. The Third Anglo-Afghan War was short and inexpensive thanks to this strategy. However, this would also hamper RAF medium and heavy bomber development until a war in Europe seemed inevitable. Now, in January 1928, Number 8 Squadron exchanged their DH-9As with the new Ferry 3F Light Daylight Bomber. Their operations were first against the Zaidiya, and then against the Subaihi Tax Rebellion. The Ferry 3, shown here in a movie tow newsreel in Uganda around 1931, would fly reconnaissance, cartography, mail delivery, resupply, and medevac missions through Aden and the surrounding mountains and deserts, as well as liaison missions between there and British headquarters in Cairo. Primarily, however, she flew strafing and bombing missions. While the RAF claimed that the villages were given warning, such threats were more often ignored than heeded. After only three months of campaigning, the Zaidi would surrender in March 1929. Remnants of the Subaihi tax revolt would continue longer. But after their livelihoods were destroyed and their power-hungry chiefs lost their base of support, they too would surrender and pay their fees to the Aden government. A typical attack would be such as that on 22nd of May 1928. Beginning from a low altitude, the villages were strafed, then subjected to fragmentation bombing, before incendiaries were dropped on the crops, covering what small plots of arable land were to be found. Left in their wake were wounded, dying, and frightened supporters of the tax revolt, who were quick then to support peace. The RAF had taken the war to the civilian population in ways that reflected the British failure in the Irish War of Independence, and later the RAF's policy over Germany in World War II under Air Marshal Arthur Bomber Harris. In the end, this would only serve as a temporary pacification, and so the seeds of resentment. In Yemen, at least, their experience with air policing was over in the summer of 1928, and Number 8 Squadron then reverted to more peaceful roles. In other parts of the empire, air policing would be a constant matter, and it would lead right up into the 1940s. The Aden Protectorate would be peaceful and enjoy prosperity in the years to come, as seen here in 1937 footage of Aden's ancient and venerable Jewish community. However, resentment against British protection would grow. Together with the Israeli-Arab conflicts, reduced economic influence, the end of the Raj, and the growth of oil wealth in nearby nations during the years after World War II, the nationalism sought out by the Zaidiya in the 1920s would rear her head once more. This time it would be with the establishment of the one-party Islamic State in Sana'a, known as the Yemen Arab Republic, or North Yemen, from 1962 to 1990. Meanwhile, the Aden Protectorate in the south would become the Federation of South Arabia, while the area around Aden herself would be the Protectorate of South Arabia, better known as just Aden. In 1963, both would erupt in the Aden Emergency in the south and the Royalist Civil War in the north. On the 30th of November 1967, the last of Her Majesty's High Commissioners, Humphrey the Baron Trevelyan, left office together with Chief Minister Salih al awadli The flag would be lowered as the Royal Marines received their last inspection. They left their Aden on beyond Suez, a vulnerable, intense nation ruled by a Soviet puppet regime. While North Yemen rebels were supported by nationalist Egypt and the royalists by Israel, their war would be brief with Egypt's side ruling the nation. In South Yemen, properly the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, peace with her neighbor in Sana'a was interrupted by a brief war in 1979, but for the most part the two had a tense but peaceful coexistence. Once more, North Yemen would enjoy Nasser's support while South Yemen had the Soviet Union and her satellites. South Yemen would also have a brief civil war in the 1980s. 
After reunification in 1990, yet another civil war in 1994 would upset the country. As southern Yemen, supported by the Saudis who had tried and failed to take Yemen in the first part of the century, tried unsuccessfully to secede from the nation. The lines have always been drawn between forces just as when under British protection, and air power has remained the deciding factor in who controls this corner of the Gulf. While air policing in the interwar period would influence British bomber doctrine and colonial policy, it would also plant the seeds of revolt in even her wealthiest and most loyal colonies and protectorates. Her surrender of her overseas obligations proved more disastrous to the Yemeni than the Smuts and Trenchard's bombing campaign had. As the last Royal Marines left, so too did the rich military heritage of Her Majesty's forces in Aden. Once more, thank you for tuning in. If you're enjoying my creations, please share this video with your friends and your groups, and I really do hope you share your thoughts and comments here. Please consider supporting them as well. Your contributions really do help with all the costs of getting this together and just the time it takes. Subscriptions on Patreon start for as little as $3. Uh, there's a link in the comments. And as soon as I start to get a few more subscribers, there's going to be more exclusive stuff on there, especially daily updates. And always remember to check in and see what you might have missed, and make sure to look for new content regularly. This is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care.